Hey, what's going on everyone? I wanted to make a video about the new changes in the Politburo when it came to the Chinese leadership. You know, there was a lot of changes that I guess people did not expect or sort of felt a little bit, you know, there was people that may be, may be better suited for the job, but then they were not picked. Let me go through my thought process on this. So for those that don't know, CCP and their meeting, they chose different leadership, right? And so how the leadership goes, think about it as a corporate structure, right? Like you're working at a corporation. And so there's seven members or seven people where a lot of that decision or future thoughts are stemming from, right? And of the seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there are sort of a hierarchy level of influence or whatnot. There was a change up in these members. Right? The change up is interesting because it has six older members, including Xi Jinping, and it has one pretty young person. And people are wondering why is there this person that is young and then the other ones are so much older than him. It's because people are thinking that, that he's the one that is going to be uh, the next leader after Xi Jinping. So now there's already speculation that because if I'm not mistaken, he was in his late 50s, if I'm not, like 59 or something like that. You know, people think that that's going to be the next leader of China after Xi Jinping. Right, and so what's happened is that there's been a, a shakeup of the leadership where I think now they have three ground forces experienced leadership inside the Politburo. People are wondering if this is the you know war council, you know, he's placed all seven of the people that will not challenge him if he decided to he wanted to take China to war. The power factions have changed. A lot of people have probably seen escorting out of Hu Jintao, his faction and power. I think has been has been decreased severely. I think overall there's I guess you would say three factions in party leadership. However, these three factions, they're not as divided as one would think like in the states. But overall, there are three factions of power and one of them I think is have been sort of diminished heavily, right? And so now what's left is the more Xi Jinping power faction and the Jiang Zemin power faction. This YouTube channel, her name is Lei and the channel is called Lei's Real Talk. And I think people should take a look at it. But she's actually really good. She gives you insight about China and she's Chinese herself. What she's been able to identify is that the factions that are much more nationalistic and would prefer China's power more projected, I think is what have prevailed. And so what, what was happening during the Politburo meeting, one side was that the assumption that there was a health issue with Hu Jintao, and the other one is that it was some sort of a purging going on, right? And from what I understand, the Politburo members and their names, and who was next that was going to be the members, Hu Jintao, none of his power faction members was going to be in the leadership. And so from what I understand, during the meeting, Hu Jintao was upset. He was not going to go along with any of this. That's why he was removed from the Politburo meeting that the video that everybody saw again uh, if you watch Lay's video I think she's stating that that it was not as planned as people might think and that during the meeting Hu Jintao was you know not gonna go along with the process that they had and if you look at the Politburo members they've all been pro Xi Jinping right I mean these are members that during the turmoil in China back then and CCP coming into power these were people with their dads were all all the fighters in that wartime and their dads are the ones that stick together and then they had their sons and then that's who they are Xi Jinping and his other generals and his all the right hand man they're all the sons of those those uh, fathers that were in those during wartime all these sons of the the ones in power right now there's nobody that's legacy rich right there's no old money in China they made all their wealth recently it was all new these are people that are have come from the bottom and up people are stating that this is going to be a future gigantic North Korea right I'm not sure if I completely agree with that there's a, a very different dynamics of this but let me just start off with in that whole uh, region they are more close to societies right for China they made a great wall of China in the past they made a great wall to keep people out then they made a a great firewall of China to digitally keep people out and then now people are looking at the Scarborough Shoals and the different island chains that China aggressively took over and put military bases on and they're stating that they're trying to jump outwards to invade the world I don't think that's the that's very different the way I'm looking at it and obviously could be wrong but it looks to me that they're trying to build a great seawall of China right rather than try to use them as a jump off point to try and invade America or something that sounds a little bit that doesn't sound like it's as feasible 
but for me that whole region is I would say more defense oriented right and when you look at the island chains they look like a much more of a wall to keep invader another invader or invasion out and that's what had me thinking why, why would you be you know putting so much emphasis on defending invasion right because that's what they've been talking about or that's what they continuously state and if you look at the Politburo documents it, it says the word security a ton of times and so I think what my assumption is that I think the CCP they're thinking or expecting maybe a possible future you know some sort of an invasion right and then you would have to wonder invasion from where like who would who would try and do that and the answer only you know it kind of you know makes people very uncomfortable of what the strategy for the future might be regarding countries that might be in heavy heavy debt and there's not a lot of options and I think that you know they want to really prepare for this right because remember people are saying that they wanted to build island chains to jump off point but in the book unrestricted warfare is states that the next generation of method of winning or whatever next world war are going to be the heavy emphasis on submarines submarines do not need land those islands and land is used for an unsinkable air carrier ships but submarines you don't need that so why do they need unsinkable air carrier ships and not only that why do they need it over there you know why not go outwards past the second island chains past philippines past guam why only that I think that it's much more of them thinking of that region, of that multipolar world, of staying in that region. I'm thinking that they're placing a bet that they can get out of the middle income trap, middle income class trap, and transition their economy depending on the sort of financial structures that we see in the future, like what's actually going to happen, what structure. They call it socialism with Chinese characteristics. I call it basically the trend of the world. If you look at it, all the Nordics, all the European countries, all the developed economies, even the developing economies, they are trending towards a state that has to have some sort of a welfare catching mechanism. And that's what I think they're gearing towards, right? They're gearing towards a future. This brings us to the inflation segment of why China keeps locking down and why they keep doing zero COVID policy. Obviously one reason is they're actually paranoid or the second reason is because they know that the inflation, although global inflation trends are trending downwards, it doesn't appear to be staying downwards and that it might be waving up and down, up and down, right? What it appears that they're doing is that they want to be, they're trying to prepare for the next wave of inflation that might come. And people are saying that, well, doesn't that hurt their economy every time they shut down their manufacturing? But here's the thing, if they manufacture things, other people buy their stuff, right? If they open up, that would be inflation, right? Because they would be opening up and the consumers of China would be buying all the products and the product's price would rise. If it's at that amount, that's a huge amount. And then the inflation will be exported and drawn out to other countries. If that's the case, then the, the consumer purchase of international consumers would drop. And if the international consumption is dropped, their profit and expectations of, you know, all of that sales companies, everything drops too as well. I think what they're looking at is that they rather do this now, COVID zero policy and all of that stuff right now and get ahead of the next inflation spike that might be coming. I think that, you know, obviously this helps international countries, right? So that inflation isn't too too up there for now, right? Because people are misunderstanding that they're closing down zero COVID because they want to drive inflation upwards, right? But I think they're thinking about inflation wrong. They think that they want to drive inflation upwards, but what they're doing is actually keeping a level of inflation, I think, down, right? Because if they opened up and everything, that inflation would go way beyond the, what we think. And so by them closing down like that, they are keeping a tap on inflation by tapping it down on their consumer purchases. And then they're preparing, you know, stockpiling all that stuff so that when they do open, because they're going to have to, inflationary pressures will go up, right? But here's the thing, with that comes the Xi Jinping pivot. It's essentially going to be a Chinese pivot. You know, again, I see much more a gearing up, a ready for the future, you know, a ready for, uh, and it has everything intact. You know, they have what seemingly seems like a small deal. For example, when they, they stamp down on games, the amount of game hours you can play, they went after the companies, right? Otherwise those games for your children will be a hamster wheel. That's what it is. Let's just call it like it is, right? And companies like, you know, Activision and whatnot, they're, what they're doing is using those RNG elements of gameplay and they're basically you know getting children hooked up on on gambling with call of duty and whatnot right what they did is they went after that they stamped that down now all their children over there are you know science and math again much more it's a much more holistic approach trying to get better caliber people if you look at the changes of Politburo members it's a much more intact if we need to go to war 
everybody would say yes. If you look at the, the decisions that may, may not make sense with the COVID zero policy and all of that stuff, it seems that they're also thinking of an inflationary world, right? They know about a deflationary world, 100%. And the way you know this is because not only they, are they up there in robotics, but the sort of design for their system seems to suggest that they know about the deflationary future, right? That's why they keep saying socialism with Chinese characteristics. And so those are just some of my thoughts about regarding the Chinese Politburo meeting and the new Chinese leadership and what I'm seeing down the line in the future. And if any of you have any other insights or differences of opinion, uh, please let me know and let's see what happens into the future.